You're listening to And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And on this episode, we are sitting down with author E.L. Shen to talk about her novel, The Queens of New York, a coming of age story about three girls from Flushing, Queens that just had its paperback release earlier this month. As always, Books and Boba is supported in part by our listeners over at patreon.com slash books and boba. So if you'd like to support um, our mission to read more Asian and Asian American books, um, head on over. Uh, Patreon supporters get access to our members-only Discord server um, where you can chat with us in real time, as well as monthly bonus podcasts. Um, so I really appreciate everyone who's supported us so far. Yeah, we had a great chat with Elizabeth about her novel. Her story has three point of view characters, each with their own coming of age um, journey. Um, we especially had a really great chat about um, one of her characters who goes to a theater camp. And we had a great chat about the racism we find in like musical theater. Yeah, so I hope you enjoy our talk with E.L. Shen. And we are here with E.L. Shen, the author of The Comeback and The Queens of New York, which just released on paperback earlier this week. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So we always like to start off our author chats, learning more about our authors and how, how they became an author. So can you share with us your, your journey to becoming a published novelist? Yeah, Absolutely. So I've always wanted to be an author. Um, my family likes to joke that I came out of the womb writing. Um, when I was in first grade, I used to put like little books into our classroom set and like force my first grade teacher to include them as part of our reading material. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, as the years went by, I started thinking about how being a writer didn't feel like a financially viable career. Um, and so I pivoted in college to thinking more about the editorial side of things. Um, and so actually it was at an internship uh, at Macmillan, um, my senior spring of college, where it was the 2018 Olympics. And I was just like nonstop talking about figure skating uh, because I'm I'm obsessed with figure skating and I used to skate and an editor was like, oh, I've always wanted a figure skating book. Would you be interested in writing one? And I was like, um, I just need a job. Also, are you joking? Um, so when I did get a job in editorial, I, uh, I was really not sure that I wanted to write because I was really focused on just working and figuring out what it meant to be an editor. Um, but eventually I decided to collaborate with this editor on writing my first book, which became The Comeback. And it was a really enjoyable experience. I had a great time. I knew the editor well, so we had a really great relationship. And that's what really uh, started my true writing career. So I have a lot of people to thank for pushing me into this um, when I wasn't so sure myself at the beginning. Yeah, like I heard about your uh, debut novel, The Comeback, like when the book deal was announced. And I was super excited as someone who loves figure skating as well. And it's so it's so great that you brought up the 2018 Olympics because that I feel like that was like one of the most dramatic uh, Winter Olympics for Ooh, figure yeah. skating, especially with like Alina Zakitova versus Yevgenia uh, Medvedeva. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, and like the men's figure skating also was like, super fierce um it's like marvin knows how much i like geek out about figure skating so um, i feel like Ruby just needs to be like a color commentator like just <laughs> oh my god that. i didn't know you were so into figure skating <laughs> i, we ha I we'll have am. so much to talk about <laughs> oh yeah it's definitely like off off show but <laughs> because know, we're here to talk about your book um <laughs> like, but, then we would just spend the whole time talking about figure skating. i mean like recent like yesterday 
Yesterday, a very big time male figure skater retired. Shoma Uno announced his retirement. And I was like, no, no, he's like (laughs) OG. Like, how dare he? But um, yeah, for for the people out there who don't follow figure skating, uh, you probably don't know our pain. Uh (laughs) It's, It's really sad. He's such a beautiful skater. I know. I love all of my Japanese skaters so much. They're like some of my favorites. Um, I mean, I feel like it fits, though, because for a lot of us growing up, figure skating was probably where we got the most, quote unquote, representation in sports. Yeah. Right. Because it's where Chris Yamaguchi, Michelle Kwan, Midori Ito, like so many, like if we wanted to see Asians excel at the Olympics, figure skating was probably the only place to go for a while. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and also, like, figure skating is so expensive, too. It is <laughs> it is a very expensive sport. So the fact that we have so many Asian Americans, like, in the sport is, uh, like, it's great. And they're, like, killing it out there. Yeah, it's wild. It is so expensive. And I was actually just talking to an Asian American former figure skater yesterday about how even, like, when you get to the top, there's not a lot of funding so it is crazy to me that there's so there's so much representation and that they're sort of shelling out all this money and making huge moves um, to skate. Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised when um, I saw like a Nathan Chen poster at like a local tire shop, and I was like, "What? Like <laughs> he's getting he's getting ad money from t- from tire shops now? Okay." I mean, I get He's it. He's getting it's it from Olympics. everywhere. Get that bag. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of. I'm proud of him. You do you, Nathan. <laughs> um, but that was your uh, middle grade novel, and how was it transitioning to young adult? Yeah. So my young adult, it was bought by a completely different house. So it was a completely different experience for me, and that was really exciting. Um, But I have to admit, it was really hard at first. Uh, The comeback is one POV. It's very much inspired by my own experiences uh, growing up in a predominantly white town and also as a skater. Um, But the Queens of New York is three POVs, so three very distinct voices. And I had to make sure that, of course, all the plots and the climaxes and the struggles and everything aligned all together, um, even though each girl was going through their individual problems. So it was really tricky for me to do that, especially within the revision stage. But once I got the hang of it, um, it it was really um, just like powerful to have this final product that took me so long to create. Yeah. So let's get into it. We're here to talk about the paperback release of your debut YA um, novel, The Queens of New York. Can you tell our readers what your book is about? Yeah, absolutely. So it's about three girls. Uh, They're all Asian American, uh, Everett Huang, Gia Lee, and Ariel Kim. And they are all from Flushing, Queens. They met at a Lunar New Year festival when they were seven, and now they're 17. So it's been 10 years of very close friendship, um, but they are all going away for the summer or they're all doing different things. So Everett, she is our Broadway queen, wants to be on Broadway, goes to, in my mind, like a little Guardia, a specialized arts high school. She's going to Ohio this summer to be a part of a prestigious theater camp. And she thinks that this will be the first step to her achieving future stardom. And Ariel, she is um, our resident genius, and she is going to a San Francisco pre-college STEM program because she's actually graduating early. Uh, She is grieving the loss of her sister, and she makes some impulsive decisions based on that grief. And then Gia is the only one staying home. So Gia Lee's parents own a dumpling house in Flushing. And she really does not want to one day run that dumpling house, but she is expected to. And she meets a very cute new neighbor from a different part of Flushing that's extremely wealthy, actually wherever it lives. And she falls for him, but she's also like... We come from really different backgrounds and she's really scared to tell him the entire nature of who she is and 
what her expectations are. So each of them are really struggling with their own problems. Um, you know, for Everett, she experiences a lot of racism in theater, um, as well as uh, some boys who may not be uh, as <laughs> nice as she thinks they will be. Um, you know, Ariel ex is experiencing a lot of grief and a lot of um, trying to figure out who she who her sister um, really was when she was alive. And then Gia is sort of navigating what she wants for her future and how to tell her parents that, which is really difficult, while also exploring her, her first real romance. So yeah, this is a very meaty book, <laughs> as <laughs> people can tell. Yeah, I mean, your novel contains three like three different flavors of Asian American coming of age all linked together through friendship and group chats and I was curious while reading it you know how did the story come about like did you come up with these stories separately and then it came together or was the friendship in these three stories like part of like the I guess the overarching novel that you you thought of yeah um so I initially was like what if I wrote an Asian American sisterhood of the traveling pants so that <laughs> I love was that my series basis. so much like I feel <laughs> so like that good. was like that was the series for all girls like in in between like the 2000 like early 2000s late 2000s I don't know it just like had such um like I, I don't know like I feel like that book started a trend towards like girlhood and summer and just like having that be like um like a total genre of its own and I do want to go back to that question later but uh but, but go yeah ahead. <laughs> no absolutely and I think that was such a formative series for me growing up so I was like how could we do that with Asian American characters and to show that Asian American identity especially adolescent identity isn't a monolith in any way shape or form so it started from that and then I started fleshing out each girl's personality individually um, and I started figuring out which parts of them were different and then how did they connect because ultimately they are really good friends and even though they have different interests um, they are people who just like love each other to the end of time um, so yeah uh, yeah what makes girlhood and summer such like an alluring canvas for storytelling in your opinion well first i think that summer is something that is so special when you're a teen because it's the really the only time obviously that you're not in school and that you have the freedom to decide what you want when everything else is decided for you um and then I think that when we think of what we want to do with our summers, we want to spend them with our friends. We want to have adventures. Um, I'm just thinking back even to the Pinterest boards that I created in high school that were all like picnics and pools and summer camp and all of these ideas and concepts of what magic and what adventure I could find that I like wouldn't find in my day to day school life um, and so I think that in particular is really alluring and then I and I think that when you're a teenager your friendships especially as a girl with other girls is just something very unique I feel like there's a closeness that you don't necessarily have all the time in adulthood which is not to say that it doesn't exist in adulthood but you know you have all this time together and that's probably the <laughs> singular time in your life when you're going to have this time where you're all like not doing anything. You're all enjoying summer. You all have these months together where you can just figure out what you want to be and wh who you want to be later. Um, and so I think that that is really special. Yeah, I, I definitely think so, too. There's something about like summer that... Um... It's just like a sea of possibility, I guess. And when you're like so young, yeah. when you're like in high school, um, your path is not set like in front of you. Like you can be anything you want, like technically. Um, I mean, I'm sh obviously you have family expectations and financial um, restrictions, but it's like everything kind of seems open to possibility at that time. And I personally think that's why it's such a popular uh, trope, popular subgenre in in YA literature, I'm curious as to, since we talked about girlhood, if your own friendship, if if you have like an own squad of your own that helped, I guess, like scaffold 
uh, the friendship for Ariel, uh, Gia, and Everett. Yes, absolutely. So my two friends in high school. It's always a trio, too. <laughs> yeah, it always is. Um, they definitely inspired uh, my uh, characters. And the reason for that is we met in high school, but we're very, very different. So my two friends, Eileen and Emily, shout out to them if they're listening. They are both current or future physicians and they play the violin and tennis kind of more like stereotypical asian things that we associate with traditional i guess quote unquote asian american identity um and they had a very tight-knit group within that within our school which was honestly very white and i did not really fit into that mold um i loved musical theater like everett and I was a bit more extroverted. I don't think my grades in math and science were nearly as good. Um, but we just sort of like were drawn to each other. And I remember that even though I didn't play any or any orchestral instruments, um, I would always have lunch with them our senior year in the orchestra room because that's where they ate lunch. So that's where I was eating lunch. Um, and our friendship has really traversed like multiple years and multiple times in our lives um we were people who uh like facetimed every day during lockdown and we we were actually all with our families in upstate new york during lockdown so we created a oh my gosh it's so embarrassing but we created this um dance group i guess uh where we would copy <laughs> like k-pop dances oh and then my god this ourselves. sounds amazing who's your who's your ultimate favorite group if you if i don't mind so asking i you. actually i actually don't like know a lot of k-pop groups this is purely oh, but you like do league. the dances for I fun follow her. <laughs> yeah, yeah she started this and then we were like okay but we were watching like the one million dance group i think oh it's yeah called. yeah yeah, um, and we would watch them on, like, 0.5 speed to learn it and then, like, speed it up. Oh, the videos are actually still on my Instagram because <laughs> they're embarrassing, but I can't take them down. So, yeah, so that kind of closeness, um, despite everything, um, despite our distance, too, and all of the different things we were doing, um, inspired Everett, Gia, and Ariel's friendships um, because as you know as I said they both do really different things and they both have they all have completely different passions um, but they really love each other like sisters and they're always there for each other and I can say that of my friends so it was just really special for me to imbue that closeness and that loyalty into their friendship um, without necessarily imbuing their personalities <laughs> I think both of them, when they were reading it, were like, which one am I? Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that they actually match because it is ultimately fiction at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your novel takes place in the modern day. Um, you know, I find that as I get older and older, I <laughs> it's harder and harder to like relate to the youth. Um, how is it? That's just you, Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. maybe maybe i just turned 40 so I'm, I'm well into like get off my lawn territory at this point happy happy 40th <laughs> of, uh, a milestone birthday <laughs> thank you thank you um how was it like did you i mean i'm always curious like do you do any research in like what the young people are doing these days or how did you like how do you find the voices for these characters yeah honestly i returned to some teen novels that i really loved as a kid um to distinguish their voices. I think that for me was really difficult. Um, so Gia was more of like my natural, slightly more flowery language voice. <laughs> and then ever I gave more of a stream of conscious, not valley girl, but slight, there's a tint of valley girl in her. Um, and then Ariel, I really stuck with like short, sharp sentences because she's, grieving and also she's really pragmatic so that felt really right for her so I kind of went back and reread some of my favorites um speak by Lori Halsey Anderson I felt was like one that I returned to also I really enjoyed winter girls um Great there were some of yeah. these like yeah there was the series I think it's called peaches 
that I also return to because it's also about three friends. So just sort of that nostalgia factor that I was imbuing into these girls in many ways. Um, and yeah, I at the time I was tutoring um, a couple of Asian American teens and tweens. Um, so I was very used to what they were doing and saying and thinking. Although I tried not to include a lot of their slang because I was like, that they could change. They a lot, by the way. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was just about to say that. Uh, every time I would tutor this girl and I'd be like, I need you to do this thing. And she'd be like, bra. <laughs> every time. I don't think there is a single bra in my novel. But if there is, I apologize. <laughs> So I feel, so I feel that like was, it's going to die out at some point. So it will. It, evergreen slang. Yeah. yeah. There will be some new annoying slang that will annoy these kids when they get to my age. So it's, it's oh, the circle yeah, of life. Because right? now yeah. like Gen Alpha is growing up. So <laughs> just always changes. But yeah. And then something else I did actually. Um, less so with the teen characters. But um, I so my my family is from Flushing. My grandparents immigrated um, from China to Flushing many, many years ago. And so even though I didn't grow up in Flushing, I spent a lot of time there as a kid. That's like where we spent every holiday. I think we honestly went there like once a month when I was a child. But when I was writing it, I wrote it during lockdown. So I could not go to Flushing. So I relied a lot on Google Maps. And then, <laughs> yeah, Google Maps, honestly, they should sponsor me because I use them all the time and I love them. But um, when we were finally able to explore the world again, I went to Flushing with a couple of friends just to make sure everything was accurate. And that was just such an amazing experience to see my settings come to life and also be like, phew, everything is not a disaster. I don't have to rewrite this whole book. But yeah, I really did try to physically be in the places or have or physically have bed in the places where the book takes place. Um, although that was not always the case, but I did my best. I think you did a really good job capturing the settings that you have in your book, uh, particularly like Flushing and Ohio. Although like I, I have to laugh because when Ariel goes to uh, the West Coast, she's like, everything is gray and like <laughs> terrible. And I'm like, dang, like what is this dunk on yeah. West Coast? <laughs> As like a California boy, I definitely like, oh, like I get it. When I went to college and many people came from the East Coast, they there's a certain point in time right during freshman year where you just complain about like how this isn't like home. And I feel like New Yorkers mm. are especially guilty of that. Like, why is oh. everything here so small? Why is everything so good? We're so elitist, <laughs> New Yorkers. We, we had We're this like... conversation in a in a different episode where <laughs> we compared East Coast Asians to like West Coast Asians. And as someone who was an East Coast Asian, I'm like, yeah, we are elitist. We are so... <laughs> We are so judgmental. Well, as we were well. have the Ooh, perspective yeah. of, of East Coast, West Coast, and Southern since she grew up in Atlanta as well. So, oh wow, yeah, yeah. I I am I am a good judge when it comes to uh, I guess Asian stereotypes, <laughs> except for like the Midwest Asians. I like like that's an that's area a, that's that a I, different breed. We'll have to that is a different research. breed. I think you guys are so strong. By the way, <laughs> if, if for any Midwestern Asians who are listening to this. Um, but you captured the setting super well. And I want to ask, like, what made Flushing the perfect, like, main setting for this story? Yeah. So I think when people think New York City, we think, like, stereotypically Manhattan or even Brooklyn, um, Gossip Girl. And I wanted to show a part of New York that doesn't get as much attention. Um, and it's also, of course, like a place where I'm that I'm really familiar with. Um, but I, I also think that Flushing has a very large Asian American population and one that is diverse within the Asian American population. Um, so Everett is Vietnamese, um, Ariel is Korean, and Gia is Chinese American. So I really it was really important to me that they be different ethnicities within the Asian American identity to to also illustrate that Asian American identity is not like again a monolith. Um so so I think it's someplace that's really rich with culture and rich with um a lot of different economic brackets as well, which I always find really 
interesting. For example, Gia lives in Flushing's Chinatown, which is not necessarily like poor, but it's definitely a place, uh, a working class environment. I mean, her parents are always struggling to make ends meet. Um, and Everett lives just like a mile or two away, if that, in um, Forest Hills Gardens. And that is a place that is, if you've ever been there, it's absolutely insane to me. It's beautiful. The houses are millions and millions of dollars. It looks like a suburb. But then you walk like one block and it, it looks like a city. So I found that really interesting that these two things can coincide in the same neighborhood. And Ariel lives in like a, a normal, I would say like middle class part of Flushing. And so I loved that like you could have all these different environments and all these people meeting in the same environment, like a parade, for example, in the same place, technically. Yeah, like I love the fact that you had all three girls be different Asian ethnicities and part of like different economic brackets, because like we always say on this podcast, Asian America is not a monolith. And um, each ethnicity, depending on like your economic class, um, you have a very specific experience. And as a Korean, um, I was just like, wow, like I like totally get Ariel and like the whole um, like her parents like using church and religion as a way <laughs> of therapy and I'm like wow that is so Korean I don't know how I don't know if like Elizabeth is Korean or not but uh, she got that right and same thing with uh, Gia and like her family and like the expectations of um, inheriting like the dumpling shop. And I was like, wow, there's like so many like specific Chinese things and specifically like Taiwanese things as well. I'm sure Marvin picked up on it um, as a Taiwanese American slash Canadian. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, like what was like, how did you decide like who was going to be what? And uh, did you like have to go to other people for sensitivity reading to get those little nuances right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just think it's so funny what you said about Korean churches. I'm not Korean. I'm Chinese American. But um, for a while, I attended a Korean American church. It's actually just down the street from where I live now. And um, it wasn't really that different from other churches that I've been to. But it was just like, so predominantly Asian American in comparison. Yeah, I just think it's really funny because um, I'm glad that I, I'm you, glad that you got it the resonated. gossiping <laughs> ajumas and like the side eyes, like so. Like I was like, wow, I feel like I'm in my youth and I am going <laughs> back in time to like when I was in church every every week as a teenager. So I think you did a okay, really good, good. job capturing it. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't bring up any traumas. Didn't trigger any trauma. Um, but yeah, I did have to do a lot of research. Um, it was really important to me that I get this right. Um, I think that I don't really recall like which, like how and why I made each girl each ethnicity. But I definitely did do authenticity reads um, for each one. So I'm really thankful to my authenticity readers for just taking the time to be so thoughtful about the story. Also spoiler alert part of the book and i won't say why takes place in busan south korea a place that i never got to go to um so that is the one place where i had to rely a lot on like google maps and <laughs> on my authenticity reader and thankfully there were not like major changes that needed to be made which i was shocked by because <laughs> i was like i'm literally looking at airbnb listings and picking that as <laughs> her place that she's staying in. But yeah, I think that also I I just like as I have grown up, um I have become more and more interested and entrenched in of course like my own culture and also in other Asian American cultures. I think that you know, I grew up in a very white place and so <laughs> my interest was in becoming whiter honestly like in terms of identity and in terms of the person and the aspirational 
idea of who I wanted to be. But as I grew older, I started looking more and more inward and appreciating my culture and appreciating um, the food, (laughs) the amazing food that, um, you know, in general, that Asian American food has to offer. That's literally like I can't even (laughs) I feel like saying that is already such a large thing because there's so many different amazing Asian foods. So, yeah, so I think that that was sort of just like a really nice cathartic way to continue to delve deeper into um, who I am and who my family is and also my friends as well. Yeah, I mean, my family background is probably closer to Ariel's. Like we're middle class. Um, I was an overachiever in in high school. (laughs) And so we definitely had more of like, you know, my parents valued academics and achievements. But I do love that your story has that kind of parent, like the, the type of parent who sees academic success as a signifier of success and also Gia's parents who, you know, they need Gia to stay and help the family because they know what success is for them. And that's like running this family, having stable income and, you know, staying mm-hmm. like working class. Um, so I really enjoyed the the different sides of Asian American family that you, that you included. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, it was really important to me to show that. Um, And yeah, that was another thing I I wanted to mention was that one of my old friends from high school, her family owns a restaurant that my family goes to (laughs) all the time. And I hadn't talked to her in a while, but I just like DM'd her on Facebook one day. I was like, could I ask you a bunch of questions about working at a restaurant? Um, And that was like literally so helpful in just the nitty gritty of it all. But, But yeah, I think that It's funny because, of course, like I incorporate parts of myself into each character, even though they're all really different. So for me, I would say that economically, I'm probably more Ariel. um, But in terms of my uh, personality, um, at least as a teenager, it was definitely more Everett. Not that I wanted to be on Broadway, but I did love theater and I was very like determined to be the best at whatever I was doing. (laughs) Well, I feel like Ariel more naturally just is smart, but she doesn't necessarily want everything that is being handed to her. And I think with Gia, what I, what I love about her is that there's this softness and kindness to her. Um, I think she's the friend that everyone turns to if they have an emergency because they know that she'll drop everything and, be there for them and that she's always like worrying about her friends and that's something that I honestly like aspire to do I hope that I am doing for my friends and I also think it this actually reminded me a lot of my two friends um, that I mentioned earlier that I grew up with um, because they are both people who would drop anything for you <laughs> at a moment's <laughs> notice and and care deeply um, so it was really fun just invigorating that all those things into to these characters yeah yeah friendship goals uh <laughs> for sure that reminds um, me that I, I did have a friend from high school whose family owned the pho restaurant and we did eat there a lot i feel like we all free. know someone if you're asian american <laughs> you at least know one person who comes from like a restaurant family and uh, probably had similar struggles that gia had yeah and it's i have open. to say oh. like usually when i read YA novels these days because as someone who is in her um, early mid 30s like I will side with the parents mostly but this time around I was like wow like I cannot believe the parents are like thrusting this much responsibility (laughs) on their daughters like I cannot believe that they're parentifying Gia so much like it must be so stressful her like taking care of her Young younger sister and like her grandma and not being able to have privacy or freedom and then I was just like enraged with Ariel's mother and just how uh, they were dealing with Ariel's older sister's death and I was like oh my god I've never been this angry with oh Asian gosh. parents <laughs> like I feel like it ha- it's been a long while since I've been like wow I'm siding with the kids and I was just curious, as someone who is an adult, obviously, like, what was that like, writing that tension between parent and child? Yeah, oh my gosh, that's so funny. I think that, for me, it was really important um, that the parents were very different from each other. And so that was a little bit tricky, honestly, because they are not on the page that often, but they need to be very distinct. Um, And, yeah, I mean, I did not have parents like that at all. I, I really had quite loving, supportive parents. Um, 
they definitely had high expectations, but they didn't, you know, enforce really hard rules. Um, and they're also third generation Chinese Americans. So I think that plays a role into that as well, especially in terms of like academics. But, you know, I also have a lot of friends with different kinds of parents. And so that was definitely imbued into that a little bit. But I think more importantly for me, it was really important that we root for these girls and their individual journeys and their decisions to find agency in their own ways, because each of them is trying to find agency and is struggling with that. And so for them to do that, they did need to have forces that were working <laughs> against them. Um, so yeah, so for Gia and Ariel, those forces were largely their parents and the, the expectations their parents had for them. And or for Ariel, the ways that her parents viewed success and viewed success in relation to their own daughter's death. Um, and I really wanted to talk more about how the Asian American community as a whole thinks about mental health. Um, I think it's getting better as is most conversations about mental health, but I definitely think that as a community, we're a little bit behind. And I think, you know, in terms of like things like therapy and talking about grief uh, openly, that's not necessarily something that feels very natural for a lot of immigrant communities and Asian American immigrant communities in particular. Um, and so that had to come through mostly through her parents. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I do think all the adults in the story in some way are the, the negative forces, although they, they can oscillate. I think that um, I tried to keep it very like limited in the POV. So <laughs> there are, are perhaps glimpses of the ways in which each of these parents are, are flawed like the girls, but um, are trying their best in their own ways. But yeah, I actually think it was most fun to write the non-parent adult um, in this story that is sort of villainous. And that would be um, Abel Pierce, who's the director of Everett's oh, yeah. Yeah. theater um, camp. <laughs> I, I just have to say, like, I had no idea that Thoroughly Modern Millie was an actual real Broadway show. Oh, yeah. And, like, to top it off, like, there was supposed to be a 2020 encore revival with Ashley Park starring and Lauren Yee rewriting the book to be less racist, but it got canceled because of COVID. And I'm so sad about that. I would have loved to see that. And I'm that. just like, I cannot believe this musical is real. And um, I yeah. was just, like, reading up on it, and there were were like high school programs who had like um, issues with controversy on like casting and yeah <laughs> uh, I'm just like curious as to like what was your initial reaction to when you first learned about this musical and when did you decide like this has to be the musical that Everett is uh, going to be in oh this musical has been with me for a very long time <laughs> So <laughs> when I was maybe 13 or 14, I actually auditioned for it. It was a sort of like professional youth theater. Um, I remember it so clearly that my dad took me to the audition um, and I got a call back. So I was super excited. I remember in this call back, I was like, oh, I, I didn't know much about the musical, but I knew that there was that there were Asian American characters or Asian characters in it. Um, and I was like, great, my town is super white, so I can play the Asian characters. Like, that was literally <laughs> my only thought. Ugh. And then I, I didn't get in, um, which was probably for the best. And then I didn't really think about it. But then, I don't know, when I, 2019, I think so. Several years later, I was part of a, a staged reading of Thoroughly Modern Millie. And actually, I was part of it because unbeknownst to me, they really needed to cast a Ching Ho or Bun Fu, one of them. And so they had asked me to be a part of this production. It was just a stage reading. So I was like, oh, okay, like, sure. I love reading through shows. I didn't even know what show it was, like, originally. They were just like, will you be part of our group? And then I realized that they wanted me to play this character. And I wrote, like, a five-paragraph email about how I was not going to play this character because <laughs> now I was older and I, like, 
new things. And I don't recall them really ever apologizing for asking me this. They didn't even know me. Like, they hadn't heard me perform ever. But they were like, sure, we'll just give you a different part to read because it's not that serious. So I don't really know why I did this, but I did go <laughs> to this stage reading as in a different ensemble character. And it was one of the most horrific experiences <laughs> ever this is like in new york city this is not some small town production and i remember that the character who plays oh my gosh mrs meeks is that her name i'm literally forgetting the name of the villain <laughs> in the early modern millie but she's basically a white woman who is pretending to be in a chinese woman so that she can quote unquote traffic girls to the orient just, just a wild wild sentence that i it's just said like i cannot believe this is a 2002 musical like it yeah, is just not so beyond or me something. <laughs> yeah i know yeah it's crazy anyway so that person who was playing that role was sitting next to me happened to be sitting next to me during the stage reading and they were singing their big number um and then they used me as a prop during that reading so they brought this like boa <laughs> i know that people can't see rira's face but it's really funny <laughs> uh and they brought this her shock um so they brought this boa and like some other props and they would like put them on me and i, I was just so taken aback and they were using this really exaggerated you know chinese accent um as a white person that Later, other members of the ensemble who were not um, supposedly cosplaying as Asian characters would also do, like, for fun. Like, they were also just using that accent in their lines. And I was just so shocked. I, I think I cried, like, on the subway all the way home. But, you know, it's New York, so you can cry on the subway and no one will care. <laughs> so that really was the big impetus for the creation of Everett's story. And I knew that Thoroughly Modern Millie had to be the show. Like, it was no question to me. And I think, for me, a lot of my own journey, just with community, community musical theater, so not even professional theater, was one of how do I belong here? And why is it that I don't belong here in a city that's like one of the most diverse cities in the country? And how do I reckon with the fact that like something I really love doing and, you know, I've been singing musical theater and studying voice since I was 13. Like, how is that something that sort of hates me, even if it's not saying it out loud, of course. So I wanted Everett to reckon with that. And the early modern Millie felt like the perfect opportunity for her to do so. Yeah, yeah I f like I really felt for Everett because like, you know, she's so positive, so confident, like, and she is confident for a good reason. She's very good with her uh, talent and skills. She's worked hard for them. And it was just so heartbreaking to see someone who is just like kind of like bigger than life and so feisty, like being forced to shrink themselves to assimilate and just like how it was a reverse culture shock for her as someone who like you know, went to a private school and like starred in all of the musicals at her school and, you know, yeah. in a place where there's like a bunch of Asians and then suddenly she comes to a theater camp in Ohio and the racism is not even subtle. It's not even microaggressions. It is just aggression. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, can you tell us like how you went about like, I guess, like writing her reverse culture shock and why that was important for you to include in the book? Yeah, Absolutely. It was honestly one of the hardest things to include because I think that for me, it was the most personal. You know, I went to Barnard, so I went to college in New York City. And I think colleges in general tend to be bubble. So I didn't do a ton of theater, but when I did, it was really lovely and enjoyable and student run and everyone there was super diverse and <laughs> there were no problems. I didn't even think about race in terms of casting and theater for the most part and so then for me when I was exiting I was like okay it'll just be the same thing and you just kind of anticipate and expect that that's true for most things in life I think when you enter one space into another so whether that be high school to a theater camp or college to your first job or or you publishing. know a new <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that out loud but yes well I said <laughs> it shots fi fired <laughs> <laughs> true. yes 
Exactly. Um, my editor and I were talking about that a lot and like how we both sort of apply Everett's story to publishing. Um, and I think that it is unfortunately so true for so many people how you uh, grow up in one space or you expect one thing and you're so excited and you're so passionate <laughs> and then that passion sort of dwindles but you actually really like the thing that you're doing it's just the environment and then because that environment is sort of gaslighting you the whole time into thinking that it's not the case you have to reckon with what next step are you going to make and I literally think that's true for like any job <laughs> any job where you have to work with a large group of people especially corporate jobs and even like you know a transition from high school to college I think there's so many transitions in life where this could apply and so it was really important for me to incorporate that yeah it was really hard I think I had a really difficult time having ever attempt to have hard discussions with her director because that dialogue was just really difficult for me to put down on paper because there had to be a lot of like insipid, no, I'm I'm really saying like a nice thing or I'm trying to be nice, but in fact, you're you're just dismissing what someone else is saying. But you as the person are trying to be like, oh, okay, like you as Everett are like, okay, like this is positive, this is positive, this is positive until you actually realize that it's not. And that's a really hard reality. So it was really intentional for me to create that arc for her and to also not have a particularly clean ending for her character. Not that I'm going to spoil it, but I think that while her ending is hopeful, I didn't want to make it one where everything is sunshine and roses because that's not going to be true of the industry that she's in if she does decide to do musical theater one day, which in my mind, she definitely does. Like she definitely is going to keep going at it. And that's true, you know, for a lot of people <laughs> that are just trying to survive. Like it's not going to be easy once you, there's not some magical cure or solution to um, systemic racism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> during that chapter where they revealed the, the music, I was like, well, it's either going to be the sound of music, which she hates, or it's like something Miss Saigon, which is problematic. Who knew you found even more problematic <laughs> script or musical to put in your book? So one of my favorite parts of the book, or one of the parts that I found the most amusing was, so um, Gia's story, her coming of age is kind of breaking away from family expectations and finding first love. But I also love that she is an anime nerd and that her anime crush was Ujiha Itachi. <laughs> Which like says a lot, like oh, she's into like the the bad boy, the bad boy, the broken yeah. one, the misunderstood. I can fix him mm -hmm. type boy. Yeah, yes. Was that did that come from you or like where, where did where did this crush come from? Um, not so not the specific anime aspect of it. Actually, I am not a big anime person. Um, plot twist. Not that I don't appreciate it as an art form, but um, basically a lot of my friends are constantly watching anime. Um, my roommate, my former roommate for the past several years was like watching anime a lot and I would just like kind of hear it and see it in the background. I'd be like, this is fascinating. That also anime can be created about literally anything. Like it doesn't have to be some big thing, but that's separate. But I do think like, I just loved the idea of Gia being like a really quiet, um, sensitive introspective girl but like what's a bad boy and to me or it was like obsessed with a bad boy on you know in anime and in manga like that those are her that's kind of what she's drawn to and to me that's more representative of the kind of internal shackles that she wants to break free from so it's not necessarily a representation of what kind of boy she wants but more about what kind of person like what kind of opportunities what kind of person she could be if she didn't already have her future planned out. So I really liked that contrast. Yeah. And I found it enjoyable. <laughs> I did like that you drew a parallel. Like, yeah, he Itachi also is someone who is forced to do something he doesn't want to do to like for yeah. the sake of his community. Yeah. Eldest yeah. Yeah. sibling syndrome, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah. That's another TikTok trend. Eldest eldest daughter syndrome is a really oh, big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that has been, I guess, pretty much pinned on my TikTok account because I am also an eldest daughter. And I'm like, cool. I think we all need a therapy group with all the trauma <laughs> that we have endured together. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, I appreciate that that is coming through because I'm actually a younger sister. <laughs> oh, you so, are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have an older sister. Uh, she's four years older. And she's definitely, like, we definitely fit into the stereotypical roles in some way. In like, she's more detail-oriented and more responsible, in my opinion. She may not agree with that, but I, I think she is. And I'm, like, louder and more extroverted. Um, and she's, like, more introverted. So, yeah. But it is That's interesting because... so interesting. <laughs> yeah, I would have never... Okay, so now things are kind of making sense because with Ariel and her older sister B, I thought it was really interesting and subverting for B to be super extroverted, considered to be like kind of like the academic failure and kind of a yeah. wild child disappointment. I'm like, in a Korean family, the eldest Korean dog, <laughs> like this is this That's is why unprecedented. it's even more of a disappointment <laughs> to her parents because she came first. Yeah. So like Ariel, like her, she is grieving, obviously, for her older sister's de death. And I thought you uh -huh. described her grief and just like how she dissociates during just random moments really well. Can you tell us more about like how you wrote those moments, like how she would just like drift out of like whatever situation she's in and and all of a sudden she's like reminded of her sister and constantly like just thinking about her sister? Yeah. Um, so I've had a lot of close experiences with grief. Um, my dad passed away when I was in high school. I was 15. Um, so not exactly the same, but definitely someone that was <laughs> instrumental to my family and to myself. And experiencing that sudden loss was also very confusing for me as a teenager. And so I really imbued a lot of that experience into Ariel's mindset. I think that in terms of like her intrusive thoughts about her sister, it's a weird uh, tug of war with that. I think for me personally, I was like, I have to think about my dad every day. And I also have to think about how he died every day. Super traumatic. Or else, like, if I forget, then it's bad. <laughs> and, like, I am not being a good person. Um, and I think for Ariel, that's part of it, even if that's subconscious. But then the other part of it is there's a lot of guilt with, you know, Ariel is sort of like the perfect daughter and her sister isn't. And now she's dead. And it's almost like, how do I rectify those two things and so her sister is almost haunting her in a way um, and, and pushing her to recalculate what being good honestly really means and what being successful means as well and so I think that that sort of haunting I I mean it's not like paranormal but that sort of internal haunting I wanted it to get like bigger and bigger and more intense for Ariel until she has to make a decision. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, you mentioned earlier that food is such an important part of like the Asian, especially in like Asian American media, like food has kind of food scenes and food descriptions have taken almost trope like status, right? Yeah. How did you how did you go? Like, did you feel any pressure to like, I need to get these food scenes like on point when you were writing them? Um, also, why dumplings? <laughs> It could have been anything. It could have been noodles. It could have been, um, I don't know, some other type of street food. Well, dumplings, I think, is something that a lot of people tend to make together. Like, I think there's a lot of street food that I love eating, but it's really hard to, to make, especially if you're not working at a restaurant. And I also think it's something that's like a community builder. And it's something that my family and I like do a lot together. Um, and so I think that when I was thinking about like the elements of a dumpling are very simple, but when you put them together, they can be really beautiful. And each part is integral to like the construction of the dumpling and therefore a a really good, hopefully, uh, analogy for the girls and their friendship. Um, so that's why I picked the dumpling. Also, just a universally beloved food. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of your question about whether, you know, how how I put together all these like different foods in the in the book and and whether it was difficult. I mean, I just relied a lot on the food that 
that I eat <laughs> a lot. Um, I'm a big dim sum fan. I love dim sum. Uh, and so I was thinking a lot about about that. And um, something that I got to do in Flushing was like go try all the different like food carts. Um, and I feel like Flushing Chinatown hot take has like the most authentic Chinese food <laughs> Um, in comparison to other parts of the city. Um, and so that was just really great <laughs> to do that. And um, I think like I relied a lot on the joy <laughs> that eating Chinese food brings for me personally. Um, there's actually a scene, um, or there's not a scene, there's a moment in my life where I, when I was visiting Flushing for book research, where um, I bought like a bunch of duck bao at this like duck bao cart and it was really cheap and it was great and then we went to the unisphere which is a really big part of the book and we just sat down and ate all this duck bao and i was like this is like the best day ever this is like everything <laughs> and um so that really inspired a lot of the the girls and like their experiences with food i think they are brought together by by the community of food and the joy of just like enjoying a good meal, um, a meal that isn't particularly fancy or expensive, um, but is something that is really important to to them and it is also tasty. Yeah, I mean, food was like pretty um, important in your book, not just like to show like that kind of joy and closeness, but to also show like alienation because when Everett is at mm. her Ohio theater camp, she's constantly complaining about how bad the food is. <laughs> and same thing with Ariel yes. in her in her college campus. She's just like the cafeteria. It's like not it's like it's the yeah. food is tasteless. Yeah, it's like it's not home. And I think there's this always this yearning to to be home and home is also related back to Gia who is at home and and sort of literally represent a lot of the food in the book because her parents own this dumpling house um so I, I yeah I did enjoy writing that juxtaposition of also food as cultural I think that and and, and food as like isolating because I think that both uh, Everett and Ariel in their own ways feel very isolated and therefore the food just just has to be bad <laughs> Yeah, I totally get that. Someone who's lived, I, I grew up in San Gabriel where our Chinese food is, is pretty good. But then moving to like, I lived in San Diego, lived in DC, where it's just, it's just not, not quite there. It doesn't there. hit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yeah. So Queens of New York came out a year ago. Your paperback version just came out recently. Um, like how has it been the reception so far? And like, are you excited that, you know, it's now in the more, I guess, accessible format for younger readers to get? Yeah. Um, I think that, it's been really lovely and exciting. You know, I think most authors are really stressed um, about the release of their books. And I am certainly no exception. I was really stressed. Um, and, you know, I continue to be stressed. But I've also just met so many lovely readers. I think with middle grade, it's harder to, like, actually talk to your readers over social media because um, they're just young and they really should not be talking to you <laughs> over social media. <laughs> But I've had like a couple of uh, young and high school readers like reach out. Um, I have, you know, I feel like this sounds ridiculous, but like some some diehard fans. Um, and that's been just really lovely to see um, people who have created bookstagrams as a result, um, which I love watching and seeing. And so I think that um, that has just been an absolute joy um, to see readers read queens across the the world really and i think having it in an accessible format and price point makes it all the better because like obviously the hardcover is the hardcover and um it's really expensive um and so i think that having more readers who can read something or even just like also continue to pick it up at their library um it's really exciting and i, I hope it continues to reach more people yeah so you recently released a new middle grade novel. Maybe it's a sign. Um, do you have anything YA coming out soon in the works? I mean, yeah. So maybe it's a sign came out in January. So that's three books down. <laughs> <laughs> I literally forget how many books I write at this point. Um, yes. And then I basically do every other. So my next one is going to be Young Adult. I'm literally working on it now. I'm about, 
as we speak, I'm about like 130 or 40 pages in. But um, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm really excited about it. It is a sweeping historical drama that spans uh, like the 1960s to present day. So there's two storylines, a 1960s storyline and a present day storyline that intersect, as well as a folktale that is interspersed. And really the key part of the book that I'm writing now is about like what it means to be an imposter, whether that be like imposter syndrome or physically being an imposter. And how does that transverse like multiple generations? And there's uh, there's some death. There are some <laughs> secrets. So there's some massive twists, hopefully, that pay off. Um, so I'm really excited. Yeah, this is definitely my most ambitious novel yet. It was largely inspired by uh, my grandmother who finally let me record her. So I'm really excited to hopefully bring the story to light in a couple of years. <laughs> I'm looking forward to learning more about that project. But um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Elizabeth. Um, it was so great talking to you about this book and good luck. 140 pages. I mean, you say it as if it's nothing, but that's like 140 more than I've ever written. So, <laughs> But I think this is going to be like a 400 page book. So I'm not not there yet. But yeah, I do feel I do feel proud of what I've written so far, she says currently. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for having me. This is so lovely. This is actually the very first podcast I've ever been on. So I'm oh like just goodness. so thrilled. <laughs> to be talking with you you guys are really <laughs> amazing hosts and um yeah i just appreciate you taking the time to chat awesome thank you so much and that was el shen the author of the queens of new york as well as middle grade novels um the comeback and maybe it's a sign all available now at booksellers everywhere including as always the books in the mobile online bookstore if you haven't had a chance to check it out, any book purchases you make on our bookstore support not only us at Books and Boba, but also your local bookstore. So um, definitely check it out. I guess before we go, just a quick reminder that our May 2024 book club pick is Kill Her Twice by Stacey Lee. It is a young adult noir murder mystery um, about a Chinese-American starlet who's found murdered in the streets of Chinatown um, during 1930s Los Angeles bringing together a lot of our favorite things um, from this podcast. Murder Mystery, 1930s LA, Noir, and also Asians in Media. Yeah, yeah. And also, it is APAM. It is our month, Asians. And we are currently doing another Asian Books Challenge. We are asking our um, book club members to create mood boards for books that have been written by Asian authors or Asian diaspora authors. We've posted some on our own Instagram. So if you guys want um, to share yours, make sure to tag us so that we can look at your gorgeous mood boards. Yeah, excited to excited to check those out. But um, with that, um, that'll do it for this episode of Book Symbol. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Elizabeth for joining us. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Life gets a little crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it can just piss us off. Enter First of All Podcast. It's a safe space for real conversations about the things that we all struggle with, celebrate, contemplate, and work through in our daily lives. I'm your host, Mindy Chang. I'm an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur with a colorful background, full life, and brilliant friends who I love to unpack life with to share with all of you. 
They are everyday people like you and me, ranging from award-winning artists, cultural icons, powerful CEOs, my hilarious childhood friends, and even my mom. Tune in for honest conversations on mental health, dating, sex, family, career, culture, and everything in between. Listen to First of All wherever you find podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective. 